Okay, so we are live and I'm going to give a few moments for folks to come in and say say hello. And uh, folks, thanks for joining us. My name is Daniel and I'll introduce our guest here in a moment. I just wanted to say hello and uh, ask you to join us, ask you to join us with some questions and that sort of thing. And like I said, I'll introduce my guest here in a moment. I just wanted to say hello and uh, welcome y'all as well. And, and once again, encourage you. So I'm gonna repeat myself a, a time or two here at the beginning, especially. Um, but I wanna welcome y'all and I wanna ask you to please, by all means, ask us some questions, throw some comments our way and, uh, and, uh, and certainly be part of our discussion, which is very important. And I'm here live with Chris Artis and, and Cindy Artis. I will introduce them here in a moment. And so again, I wanna encourage y'all to, to uh, join us with your comments and questions. And I wanna introduce you without further ado to my guest. So my name is Daniel Garcia Ordaz and I'm a writer, I'm a teacher as well. And uh, I've been doing some interviews during this whole COVID thing. And so I wanna bring up uh, our guests. So welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome Thank Chris Artis and Cindy Artis Jenkins. So, uh, so Chris, where are you coming uh, to us from? I am live from McAllen, Texas in my house. And um, it's very hot outside, so I'm glad I'm inside. <laughs> Yeah, so for your your you folks in like Illinois and like Alaska or whatever, yeah, it's 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 real hot for real down here, like air conditioned hot. So it's one of those things of living in the South Texas heat of the of Rio Rio Grande Valley, about ten minutes from the Mexican border. So welcome, Chris and Cindy. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from. Well, I am originally from Peoria, Illinois, uh, but I moved to Florida um, in the fall of 2018 in the Panhandle, and in just January of this year, I moved to Southwest Florida um, near Fort Myers. So it is also very hot here. Um, I just left McAllen a week ago, and I think the temperature is about the same here as it was there. Um, it seems much more humid here, uh, and we're actually just getting ready to have a big old thunderstorm. So hopefully I'll stay with you. Yeah, I hear you. So how far are you from, which which coast are you at now? We're on the west coast, the, on the Gulf side. Mm -hmm. And we're uh, about, we're, we're right near, um, we're about 30 miles from Fort Myers, about an hour and a half from Miami. Sounds on, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just kind of stretch your arms out and you can touch both coasts there in Florida. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> what is that interstate? Is that 95 or that goes all the way? So, um, 75. 75. 75. Okay. I keep telling her I want them to build a causeway from South Texas over to South Florida. Maybe a tunnel? Time. Maybe a tunnel, yeah. you know? <laughs> it makes sense um, that you have to go all the way up and all the way down. It just doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I would so. prefer above the water. No, I hear you. I, I'm a little yeah. bit claustrophobic myself. Not for like an MRI, but I think for that one tunnel, yeah. what is it, in Mobile or something in Alabama going into Florida, into Pensacola? There's that oh. tunnel. Yeah, and that's yeah. It's quick and easy, but it's a little bit trepidatious. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, well, welcome again. So my name is Daniel Garcia, and I'm a school teacher. It's my 14th year teaching that we just wrapped up. And uh, how y'all deal, dealing with the whole COVID thing? Of course, we're all in education right now. Cindy, I know you have a different background as well. Um, but recently we're all in education. And uh, how did you see, Chris, like the year wrap up for folks? So it was a rough, rough year. Uh, it's and talking to, I'm retired. I taught for 29 years, 28 of those in McAllen ISD. And I've been retired, believe it or not, seven years. And, um, but I am still, you know, I still have a lot of friends like you, Daniel, who are uh, remain in education. And Cindy is in education in Florida. So uh, I have a, my dearest friend from college is an educator in North Carolina. So I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of educators and kids. And it was rough. Um, 
I think sometimes we forget how much we love having students right in front of us and just that interaction. And even if you're doing Zoom or Google Classroom, that is just not the same as them being right there with you. And I think kids realize that and uh, even administrators were like, I miss my kids. And so I think it was really hard and everything happened so fast that actually that is a, a quite a mental health issue, this whole COVID mm -hmm. for, for many reasons, which I know we'll get into. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, and Cindy, you uh, you were in the classroom re before this whole COVID thing and, and yes. happened, rather. How did y'all yes. kind of wrap up the year? How did that go for you? you no, know, it it was really rough. Also, I mean, I, it was um, you know, I think it was it was I don't know who had it more difficult. I think it was equally difficult for the teachers. You know, to all of a sudden, you know, have to completely shift um, the way they were teaching in front of students um, and with students directly. Um, than to, you know, online and, and to accommodate, you know, students who um, definitely weren't as comfortable um, online as, as in class. And, you know, I found it real interesting as an aide, um, you know, it was difficult for me even to not be, even though I had just started at the school I'm at now um, in January, uh, there was some, you know, I was able to get to they weren't doing their homework, I could just go up um, or doing their assignment they were supposed to do in class, just go up right and sit right next to them and go, okay, you know what, let's sit down, let's get this done and sit right next to them and help them get it done. Um, but I found it very interesting that there were students who, um, when they were in class, weren't necessarily doing their work and you couldn't get them to do their work. And then once we got online, they started doing work. And so, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they didn't think it was cool <laughs> to do their work while they're sitting there in the classroom or, you know, they were too busy socializing or, um, you know, whatever. But I, it was very interesting to me. I had several conversations with my the different teachers um, in, in whose rooms I work about that. Uh, what, uh, Cindy, what uh, grades do you deal with? It's high school. Um, I was mainly in sophomore uh, classes and intensive reading classes and, uh, and an English class. Yeah, that's interesting that they, sometimes students, uh, I don't know, they, they have to like show off for their friends or yes. perform this way or that exactly. way. And and yet in, in the privacy of their own home with their jammies on and stuff, they're, they're like, oh, okay, yes. no one's gonna know yep. I'm a nerd now because I'm at home yes. or whatever. I have, I've had- Yeah, or I don't have that. to show out for anybody. Yeah, or, or or misbehave and show out like right yes. like perform that yes. way. Uh, Chris, what uh, what did you teach in those years? So for my first thirteen years, I taught in McAllen ISD's uh, regional school for the deaf program, and one year in the Brownsville uh, uh, school for the deaf program. Um, and then I switched over to teaching American Sign Language as a foreign language. So the students, instead of taking Spanish or French, they had the option of taking sign language. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially for, for hearing people? Right. So it was for hearing people who wanted, and a lot, it was, it was, I, one, one of the things, one of the many things I love about the Rio Grande Valley is, of course, many of my students were already fluent in Spanish. And so they had this added um, ability to add sign language um, and become fluent in sign language. And because um, we had regional school for the deaf students in our district, they had the opportunity to communicate with them and not so much at Mac High, but when I was at Memorial, but we would do events in the community with the deaf. And so, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Chris, wasn't Texas one of the first states to approve um, ASL being offered as a foreign language option to high school I, students? I'm not really sure of the order, but I know that there still are states that don't allow right. sign language as a foreign language. So yes, we were really lucky and, and I was very uh, proud of McAllen ISD because um, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure I'm, you know, this is correct, that McAllen ISD was the first uh, district in the Rio Grande Valley to offer sign language as a foreign language credit. Yeah, and it's of course such a great tool to have, not just to be 
quote unquote bilingual with Spanish and English, but now maybe trilingual and so and and it, it could be financially it could pay off and just to, for human interaction, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. I've had several of my students who have become speech language pathologists, sign language interpreters. And, and, and like I used to tell them, even if you become a doctor, an attorney, whatever you become, you will have that ability to communicate with members of our community who are deaf. And so, in, you know, it doesn't really matter what career choice they had, they would still have that option mm -hmm. or that ability. Right. Well, and so uh, let's take it back a little bit. Uh, uh, go back to uh, to Illinois. Is that where y'all grew up? Yes, Peoria, uh, Illinois. I love I love that 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 name, Peoria, Illinois. So um, so it's now Illinois. The no. S island at the end. <laughs> no. So it's Illinois. If any of my students tune into this, they're going to start laughing because that was one of the forbidden words in my classroom. <laughs> Shut that noise down right now. Exactly. Yeah. I used to tell them, there is no noise in Illinois. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so I guess name for the Illini Indians over uh, Native Americans from that area. So uh, tell us about your childhood. Uh, you had quite a few siblings. Go ahead, Sin. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we have nine uh, children in our family and um, I'm number four, Cindy's number six, and our baby brother, Steven, who's now in his 40s, uh, he broke the tie of boys and girls. So we have five boys and uh, four girls. And I, for me, it was, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way than to have, you know, just so much fun all the time. Well, you know, not all the time, but <laughs> most of the time to just have so much fun and, and to have just your built in support system and cheerleaders and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so how did, uh, how did y'all celebrate, uh, let's say birthdays? Birthdays were fun. Um, of course, you know, there was always, you know, mom always made sure we had cake and, you know, it seemed like it always seemed like we had like tons of presents, but in reality, I think we only had like two <laughs> maybe. Um, but it just always seemed like there was a lot, but that wasn't even what was important. One of, and our um, grandparents um, would take the birthday, um, whosever birthday it was, we get to go to this restaurant they loved in Hannah city, which was not too far away. It was called Gills. And, um, just the birthday child. And so that was, you know, something we always look forward to. And, um, you know, it was just, it, we just, it was just fun being together and celebrating together. And um, yeah, we always felt special. I still love my birthday, I think, for that reason, <laughs> because it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was mine. And, uh, and that's, I, that's a challenge for parents when, especially when you have nine children to make everyone feel like you're important and you're special. Yeah. But my parents were able to do that. Yeah, yeah that's impressive. Um, yeah, yeah mom, my mom's mom, right? My maternal grandmother had nine children. And when my, when my mother was a little girl, she decided she was going to have nine kids. And homegirl went out and did it. You know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's I know. Like, wow. So. Yeah, uh, I, I had three. I have three kids. And I can remember when, you know, they were younger, like talking to our mom so many times saying, like, sometime mom, I, I waver between whether you were a saint or insane. And, you know, just depending on the day with my own kids, I was like, okay, today's a day where I think you were insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so Chris, how did, uh, how was Christmas for y'all? I guess maybe some snow. I don't know. Almost always snow, which was uh, to this day, because uh, I always go home uh, for Christmas. I've never missed going home for Christmas. And um, to this day, I want snow Christmas Eve and Christmas. And that's enough, you know, for me. But it's to 
have so I, I mean I can just remember coming out of church and snow on the trees and just so beautiful and you know of course sledding tobogganing uh, snowball fights all that uh, too but. So Cindy spoke about us thinking there were so many gifts, but um, <laughs> Christmas, um, we would all wait upstairs because we, we had a second level um, in our house and um, we would wait upstairs till everybody was up on Christmas morning. And then we would run down the stairs and well, you have so many kids, right? So my parents would have like, instead of putting everything under the tree and everyone's digging, they would have a stack, you know, for each child. And when we were little, it, it did. It seemed like, oh, my gosh, we each got 30 gifts at least. Right. But later in life, when we would talk to mom about it, she would go, oh, I'm so sorry to burst your bubble. But you each had like three. <laughs> but I think we'd see our gift and then we'd see each other's gifts. And and again, it wasn't about how many gifts did I get? It was just the joy and my parents like they just got so much joy from seeing something we loved because with nine kids you didn't have a lot um i mean my mom didn't work when we were or she worked very hard but in the home mm. and our dad was an electrician for the <laughs> local electric company so we didn't have you know we had a lot of hand-me-downs and you know everything like that a lot. so a lot yeah. So uh, where'd you go to church? What kind of church? It was a Catholic church. Um, wasn't too far from our house. Um, but yeah, every every Sunday, every holiday, um, Easter, we'd all the girls would always get to had, get a new Easter dress. And um, same for Christmas. And we all went as a whole family, took up an entire pew. <laughs> and um, yeah. Same, come home. same kind of dress, did you say? A what? You have a dress, uh, same kind yes, of dress. Yes, we would get, we would get, to, we would get to um, buy a new dress for no. the. Oh, not, not matching, matching, but it was a new. Okay. <laughs> no, not matching. <laughs> mom, mom had five boys, so she would have them matching sometimes. No. Uh, wow. After oh, that, yeah, I was never not. matching. You know, I'm, I'm number seven. I, we didn't. Ain't nobody got time for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> when my sister was, she wanted a girl, You're so finally. Out. Yeah, yeah, I was left out when she finally had a girl. I think she's like, okay, I'm done with that. So <laughs> I was like, bonus. Like, I already got five boys. Like, you're just extra, dude. So uh, <laughs> hashtag no issues. So, but uh, oh, cool. So, um, so fast forward a little bit here. So, uh, what brought you to Texas, Chris? So when I was growing up, every winter I would battle like serious throat issues. I had strep throat and it was just miserable all the time in the winter. And I just decided I had to live somewhere where it was warm most of the year. And when we were um, growing up, my grandparents were winter Texans in San Benito and never came we never had the opportunity to come with them or anything but you know i texas was always on my mind because of my grandparents and my grandfather actually my paternal grandfather actually grew up in the dallas area and so i don't know and i my senior year of college i uh, went to the career development placement office at my college and Lo and behold, there was an opening for a teacher of the deaf in McAllen, Texas. So I interviewed and that was it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's awesome. What did you, I guess, get your degree in once upon a time? Uh, my bachelor's degree is in deaf education. Oh, I see. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're a writer as well, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Are you still blogging, uh, doing column, columns or? I am uh, doing freelance writing for the Valley Business uh, Report, uh, and I ha I still have my education blog. I just now that elections are coming up and the new legislative session, I just need to get my discipline back to do it on a regular basis because I really have uh, slacked off on that. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> um, so, so Cindy, how was your visit to the Valley under the whole COVID thing? How was the airplane and all that? Well, um, on the way down, it wasn't so great. And I was, 
um, not very um, happy <laughs> about that. Uh, they the plane was entirely too crowded, um, and and you know the airline had said you know if you're uncomfortable and you'd like a little more space and you know between you um, and and who's sitting next to you just let us know. But I don't know what they would have done because I saw one empty seat. Of course, there was somebody sitting in the other seat, so um, that was a little frustrating. Um, they did require everyone to wear a mask, which was fine. Um, they didn't offer any beverage or, you know, snack service, which was fine. It was kind of funny, though. They said it was because of social distancing when really that really doesn't have anything to do with social distancing. But, um, you know, everybody understood. Um, the way home um, flew a different airline, and they were very um, conscientious about it. Like, it was, they were a little bit bigger plane, and so, but they did not sell, you know, as enough tickets, they stopped. They would let, you could sit in the, you know, window or aisle seat, but they kept the middle seat open. They wouldn't let anybody sit unless, of course, you were together flying with someone. Um, so they were much more um, conscientious and they did do a beverage service. They just did a can of um, uh, water, uh, sparkling water or whatever. And then um, it gave you a straw um, to use with it. And um, yeah, so flight home was much better than the flight down. Yeah. Uh, well, we're all under a lot of stress with this whole COVID thing. And, and like you mentioned, the students as well as the administrators, the teachers, of course. And and uh, it, it was a lot more work to, for me to finish off the year because of, I mean, just the mental strain and even the physical part of just sitting on your butt for so long yeah. without a, a quick break to the office to make a copy or to drink some water or use the bathroom or whatever. Um, I mean, I don't, I would have to tell myself, get up, you know, you've been sitting too long. Like, um, so it's, uh, it's, a uh, we lost, you know, the educational component. We lost a few things for sure, as well as just mentally, it just takes a strain on you, uh, takes a toll yeah. on you. Um, so June is, is men's health month, just kind of in general. Uh, of course, it, I guess it's related to father's day as well. It's, it's LGBTQ pride month as well. And it's National PTSD Awareness Month, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so, um, so I know that uh, you you have a you know situation here with your family that's difficult to you know to talk about. But um, if you if you would please let let us know what that's all about. Um, well, we um, our younger brother um, Tim, who was. Uh, so I'm number six, Tim was uh, number eight. Uh, he was, I, I, I always refer to him as like this almost angelic child because he was little and you know, most of us had you know, dark hair and um, brown eyes or hazel eyes. Um, Tim had this white blonde hair and these crystal blue, beautiful eyes. And like literally when you'd be walked down the street with him or if you'd be in a store with him, um, people would just like stop and like look at him. He was just this angelic, beautiful child. And um, he, he just, he, he just he led an average life. He played sports, he played little league. He, um, but everyone loved him and he always had this huge circle of friends and, um, he didn't, uh, start playing football until he went to high school, uh, but he excelled. I mean, that was clearly his sport and, um, just was an outstanding athlete. But I think Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like in high school, I think when, you know, he still had this huge circle of friends, but he seemed to become the friend that everybody relied on. You know, they went, they, that was, he was the one that his friends went to when he had troubles and problems. And Tim was always, you know, able to, you know, help them through situations and everything. And, um, he, he was an okay student in high school. He didn't, um, I wouldn't say he was, uh, 4.0 by any means, but he did fine, but he got a full Scott football scholarship to um, a division one college in Illinois. And he played football there and um, continued to excel. And that's where he, I think, started picking up 
academically and ended up graduating from college as an academic All-American and um, broke all kinds of football records there. So this theme of um, overachieving, you know, is, has, is emerging. And uh, he, when he graduated from um, college, he was the youngest person hired in this particular department at Caterpillar um, ever. And he was the first person that had been hired in this particular department in like several, several, several years. Um, and he just did fantastic. It was great having him right there in Peoria and um, continued to achieve and um, ended up, he was getting um, engaged to someone from the Chicago area and he transferred up to Aurora with Caterpillar, um, got his MBA, um, he got married. Um, and he, he, I think probably then is when um, stress and uh, things started to get to him. You know, he had a young child, he was traveling quite a bit. He was just, you know, studying to get his MBA, but he was still doing great and overachieving. And um, he ended up getting lured away from Caterpillar by um, a different company up in Chicago. And uh, so he left Caterpillar, he was traveling a little more ironically, Caterpillar was one of his accounts. And so he was traveling off into Peoria, which was great for me because, you know, every time he'd come to Peoria, you know, he, we'd have lunch and sometimes he had presentations and he'd need to make changes. And so he'd call me and ask me if I could print something and whatever, but he, he, he um, I would say probably 2001 is when some of the times he was in Peoria and I started noticing he was, you know, thinner than normal. He always had a fantastic build, you know, he was never heavy. He was just very muscular and athletic and always, but I know, and he looked really tired. And um, so I would say, ask him about it and um, just said, you know, it was work and the baby and um, assured me that everything was fine. And uh, but that kind of continued. And then, and then later, um, towards the end of that year, when he came home, he was still looking very thin um, and, and equally tired, but he seemed a little more uh, anxious and on edge, which was definitely not like him. There, Tim never had anything come his way that he was not able to handle, you know, um, and uh, clearly we now know <laughs> that he was he was dealing with, you know, some depression and probably some anxiety and but he didn't know that and we didn't know enough about what then what was you know about the the illness to to really know and uh so the spring of 2002 he um i had gone um up to chicago he and several um, of his friends were kind of turning 30 all at the same time within a matter of weeks and the wives um, his wife uh, Jill and, and the other wives were planning a surprise party. And so I was able to go up for that. And, you know, I, then it was at the end of April and his birthday was early May, but I remember just almost feeling this sense of relief. One of our other brothers who lives in Chicago, I, we went together and he, cause Tim looked so good. I mean, for the first time in like a really long time, he just didn't look as tired and, you know, he didn't look as thin. It looked like he had put a little weight back on. And, and so I almost had this sense of relief. Um, but then he, he just, I think from there, just steady decline and his wife was kind of aware and, but you know, we just didn't know enough about the illness. And again, I don't even think Tim knew. Again, he, he had never, nothing had come his way that he hadn't been able to overcome and conquer. And this was bigger than him, clearly. And um, he just ended up, he, he, he didn't want us to know, like, how bad. He kept assuring everybody, you know, that he had it under control and, and everything was okay. But it, it wasn't that, that wasn't the case. And at the end of July of 2002 he, he took his own life and it was even though we knew he was dealing with something and by then we knew what it was it was just an unbelief i mean if you asked anyone anyone who knew him or had even read anything about him um they would have said there's no way like that was the last person on earth you would ever you know consider who 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 
would would do that. Um, so, Chris, I'm sorry, I kind of monopolized. No, I'm glad it was very, very accurate, very honest, and so I was living here, of course, and um, I uh, had gone home just before this. Um, I think it was uh, mid June. Um, I always go home and I'm there for my mom's birthday in early July. And, and, uh, we had a little picnic or something and he and his wife and their little girl, uh, were there. His, his daughter was just a toddler at that time. And, um, our other brother, John, who lives in the Chicago area, he had ended up sharing with us, look, you know, Tim is going through some stuff because Tim ended up, he did end up confiding in John because he was up, up there. And, but I was not prepared when I saw him because he was way thinner and he was just nervous. And Tim was just Tim before this. He was just so lighthearted all the time. He was seriously the life of the party. He was so funny and just, you know, people love to be around him. And um, so I was a little bit shocked, but John said, you know, he's, he's getting some help and, you know, we're watching out for him. And so, you know, I felt pretty good and came back down here. And I think it was two weeks after I came home that I got a call one morning from my sister-in-law and uh, you don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's crazy. I, I just uh, like y'all, my mom, mom and dad had nine kids. And uh, so now when people ask me, you know, how many brothers and sisters do you have? How many siblings do you have? We were talking before this interview with y'all kind of do the same thing I do. I have to name them. <laughs> no, cause my, my oldest brother uh, was killed in a car crash in, in 1997. And, and, you know, there's no warning. There's no, you know, uh, preparation. There's no goodbye. And so now not having him, I mean, uh, we, we had lost a brother when I was young. I was about six and he was nine. He, he, he had uh, been born with heart problems, complications, and he died after a surgery. So, so we had lost him and, and uh, so there, you know, and so now I don't even know still the number. I don't know the number. I, I have to just count them by name just to find out, you know. Um, and as a kid, I was six years old when, when my older brother passed away from the heart problems and I didn't know how to process it. I remember the burial, I mean, vividly. Uh, my aunt was embracing me, tears on my back and, uh, and, uh, but I, but I, I would, I would, I was about six years old and I would, I would look for him maybe like in my mind, like maybe he was kidnapped, you know, like I would look for him in every highway. I would look in people's station wagons next to us or whatever, you know, uh, looking for him. And, and, and that was kind of as a little kid. And, and I think in the Mexican American culture, the Hispanic culture, I think there's this idea that has been perfect perpetrated for, for, for centuries, really, uh, this idea that Hispanics, especially men, uh, we, we're, we're macho, and this machismo does not allow us to open up and discuss and so on. But uh, that's verging on racism, really, because, I mean, paternal, paternalist, I mean, the paternalistic society has been built certainly in Western cultures and so on. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's a male thing. It's a human thing, certainly, but it's definitely it's a male thing. It's not just a Hispanic male thing where men are somehow in our society as, as certainly in the U S I mean, we are, we're not built to express or to open up, to share our feelings, to, to open up about God, God forbid, uh, depression or, or anything like that. There's that stigma of speaking about mental health, uh, and so um, this is something, of course, that, you know, y'all are still processing, really. It's not something that just goes away after a while. That, Ever. Um, morning. And, you know, and Daniel, can I, can I 
uh, chime in there uh, because you are so right. Like I, I do think sometimes there is a misconception that you know um, pe uh, men of other ethnicities don't have that same um, feeling, but I do think I think mental health or you know mental illness. I think it's already hard for anybody to discuss just because a lot of times people don't know what to say or you know how whatever and even if they're going through it themselves it's like a hard thing to admit and so um but i think for men it's definitely more difficult and you know cindy touched um a couple times on this whole idea of overachieving and I think it made it even more difficult for Tim because he had never, you know, that we know of, he had never experienced that before. He was always like, you know, top football player, this standout college uh, student and athlete and getting this great job and, you know, this wonderful wife and beautiful little daughter. And, you know, it was just like, how do I deal with this? And then there is even though I have to admit, I do not understand the stigma of taking medication. If, if you can wake up and Cindy and I have had this discussion many times, like if I can wake, if I wake up in the morning and I know that I'm going to be so sad if I don't take medication that I, you know, I need because I, you know, do have this issue or whatever, I'm going to take that pill every single day. I am because I don't want to live in with anxiety and, and depression and as much as as much as you can avoid it. I'm not saying that you take a pill and you don't have that. Please, you know, understand. But if it can help in any way, I'm gonna take it. But there is still this feeling of, okay, I'm feeling better now, so I'm not gonna take the medication anymore because I really have to do this on my own. And it appears that that have been going on as well. You know, and I think too that one of the things it's that it's, you know, when I used to go um, when I was still living in Illinois and I would go and I would talk to high school students um, every year. And, you know, one of the things I would, I would say to them is that, you know, I'd just pose the question. If you were, if, if you were, if I was standing up here in front of you and I was bleeding profusely from, you know, my leg, or if I had a broken leg, I mean, what would you tell me to do? Go to the doctor. You know, inevitably they'd say you need to go to the emergency room. I think it's because it's an illness of the brain. And so it's not something like you can literally like physical see that you have a, you know, you're bleeding or, you know, you've fallen and have a, you know, head injury and you're bleeding from your head. I just think it's such a hard thing. And, and, and if you're the one who's going through it, you know, if you asked, if you asked me today, um, you know, gee, what's wrong? And I said, oh, you know, I'm not doing very good in school or, but you asked me tomorrow, it would be something different, different because of it being an illness with your brain, you can't really, you know, something's wrong, but you can't really put your finger on it. It's always something, you know, it's that, it's that everything in your world is wrong and it's not just one thing. And I think that's what makes it so hard, you know, to talk about. And so, you know, I think that puts people, I think we're doing much better, you know, talking about it yeah. and as, as a society, but I think there's a long way to go. And I think, um, you know, if you start medicine and it makes you feel better then I think everybody, you know, a lot of people think I'm good and not that I need to hand, you know, necessarily, I think there's a lot of people who think they can handle it on their own, but just that I'm feeling really good now. And they don't understand that it's, you know, it's an ongoing thing and, you know, you need to just make that kind of a routine, just like you take a vitamin. So. Yeah. Whether it's a chemical imbalance uh, yes. or whether it's trauma or whatever the cause is, there's a medicine for, for it that possibly can help. And I know that there's side effects to where some antidepressant medicine uh, for men in the past that, you know, their men would get breast enlargement, for example, or yeah. excessive weight gain and so on. And so it's like, I don't want to look like this. I don't want to feel like this. Or they gave me this something for bipolar. And now I'm like walking around like a zombie. I can't even think. So yeah. I'm not taking it. Because I can't create, I can't interact. Uh, uh, so yeah. there's, um, you know, maybe the side effects physically also just kind of take a strain on the person. But gosh, we're 
we say all the right things in the classrooms. One of the first lessons that I give my students every year, we talk about judging a book by its cover. And so we literally judge a book by its cover to help them get excited about reading and that sort of thing. But uh, we talk about, you know, judging folks as well. And, uh, you know, in the classroom, we all say the right thing. Like, it's not okay to judge. And yet here we are having all these marches and, and protests because <laughs> we're really bad about judging. Um, and we, we, we do judge people for uh, something like we don't judge them for diabetes, which is a chemical imbalance, but we judge them for right. mental health issues. Right. So quick. And, and illness is an illness and nobody asks to get heart disease and nobody asks for cancer and, and, and a mental illness is the exact same situation. You know, nobody asks for it. What do you do when you're diagnosed with heart disease or cancer, or, um, you know, diabetes, you go to the doctor and you find out what you need to do to be well and you follow that course of treatment. And this is the exact same situation. And you know, sorry, my hair. Um, <laughs> uh, other um, thing that I need to say there is, as with other physical illnesses, and and actually, you know, mental illness, although it's known as a mental, it is actually physical as well because it's our brain. And um, but just like with other illnesses. A lot of times the first medication you try is not the one that's going to work and sometimes not the second one either or the third one. And so it does require some hard, you know, very difficult patients and, and it, you know, a lot of people also need someone to talk to and whether that be a trusted friend, a spouse, a sister, a brother, um, or a professional in the field. Um, that's another thing that it's, it's funny how, you know, the Hollywood stars, it's almost like this, uh, it's almost cool to say I have a therapist. Um, but for most people, it's very difficult to, you know, for most average individuals, it's hard for us to say, you know, I have a therapist appointment or, you know, my therapist said or whatever, because the, because of the judgment. I, I agree with Cindy though, that I definitely see a turn. Thank God. Um, we still have uh, quite a long way to go. And I think mostly with the field of mental uh, health, um, I think for those suffering from severe uh, depression and other mental illnesses, I think it's very difficult to find um, long-term um, places where you can go and get the help you need that is lasting but overall i i would say there's definitely been an improvement yeah and i know that there's even uh at utrgv our local university the student uh veterans uh group there the club as well as the office there uh they're reaching out to veterans and and uh using zoom or that kind of platform to reach out specifically for for mental health awareness and and uh and just chats and stuff. So this whole COVID thing has, I guess, given us new tools that, that have been there, but I mean, put them in our hands, if you will, um, so that, I mean, social media in general, I know it can be very negative. Uh, when you all, when we were, you know, kids, if we were bullied, we were bullied only in the classroom or in recess mm -hmm. and in the, on campus, and we went home to a loving family now kids are bullied at school and then they're cyber bullied 24 yeah. seven. So there's those ne the negative aspects of social media, but on the positive side, we have, uh, you know, uh, support from all over the world, uh, from friends and strangers that we may have not, not met, but acquaintances and so on. And we have avenues that help us to just, uh, whether it's quarantine karaoke, which is a Facebook page, whether it's uh, reaching out like this to to have conversations uh, and so many other uh, avenues out there available, uh, what would you say to someone? I guess who's in a, who's in your shoes, who's dealing with this uh, recently, having lost someone like that. In Hidalgo County, I, I do want to bring up that Hidalgo County uh, when Richard Cortez was. Uh, elected as the county judge in Hidalgo County, one of his top three priorities was to establish a mental health coalition. 
uh, which is now a mental wellness coalition. But yeah. anyway, so Hidalgo County, it's it's relatively new. So it's it's an ongoing project, but it's uh, bringing together mental health resources from across the county to um, per, to provide a, and you can Google Hidalgo County Mental Health and and go to there's actually a page now set up and um, they're they're just developing a brochure with all, all kinds of resources and everything and but I think the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention AFSP AFS dot org is an amazing resource uh we have two um local ladies uh melissa inojosa zamora and missy moreno who started the out of the darkness walk here and um that is a great resource for anyone a, fr a family member a friend a co-worker who has lost someone to suicide um but the afsp website also has incredible Incredible resources, um, whether you're the person who needs help or you're the person who loves someone who needs help. Um, yeah, and I, I think I think every community has you know resources available. It's a matter of finding them. But if you're someone you know who has lost someone um, to suicide, I think it's important to know that you know one, there's no timeline on grieving and you shouldn't ever feel bad. You know, I mean, it's been almost 18 years and there are still days, you know, where I cry because I, you know, miss my brother. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it was just such an unnecessary loss. But so, I mean, that's, that's one thing is that, you know, it's okay to grieve and you should grieve. Um, to, to definitely, rely on the people around you, you know, your family, your friends. And if you need to talk, you need to talk because the one of the worst things to do is to keep it in, you know, what you're feeling inside or journal or just something to get those feelings out. And, um, you know, so just never be afraid to, to, to reach out, um, to talk to someone, um, to get the help you might need to get you through it. A lot of communities have um, survivors of suicide groups and, um, you know, grieving and loss groups. And, um, and that, I think if there was one thing I wish I would have done then, I think I, I probably would have participated in one of those, but, you know, back then and I was just, um, in my feelings, so to say, but, uh, you know, I mean, we all talked as a family, but I, I, I somehow felt like my pain was different than anyone else's. And, um, you know, and I, I it, was different to a certain degree, but um, I, I would really encourage anyone to participate in that, to be surrounded by people who know that similar pain and loss and share, you know, circumstances. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's so on Cindy. And, and Daniel, I would also say that uh, you need to put on your vest of protection because uh, well-meaning people uh, can say some really um, uh, painful things. So I remember there were people who sent my mom uh, mass cards for my brother, which was a, a gift of love. But some would write in there, well, because I know someone who, you know, dies from suicide, can't go to heaven, which, you know, used to be a belief that, thank God, is not, um, you know, expressed anymore. Uh, because, you know, who would want to believe in a God who would turn away someone who lost their life because of being in that state of mind? Um, but also um, just people who are, say suicide is selfish, you know, when they don't understand that it's mainly because of, um, you know, not being, um, what do you call that, uh, rational. You know, when you stepped over the line between rational and irrational and thought, it's not selfish. I think what we have learned is that a lot of people who end up dying as a result of suicide actually believe in their minds that they're doing a favor to the people who love them because it's so hard to watch them suffer. And of course, we know better uh, in our rational minds, you know, that's the worst thing you do. But um, so, so I think that, you know, when you're stuck
suffering a lot do need to understand that it really is um 99 of the time well-meaning people who just um say really wrong things right right and i think and i think too that i i remember um we used to we had had um invited a his name was ross sabo and he was the director of youth outreach for the um um uh, youth mental health, aware, the national youth mental health awareness campaign. And we brought him to Peoria to talk to all the high schools and things. And Ross had had, um, had attempted suicide. And I remember him saying um, to all of the uh, all of the high schools and just in my conversations with him, he said, I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how to go on with the pain I was you know, feeling anymore. And that in different his different circles and speaking with others, you know, who had made attempts, you know, and were thankfully, you know, unsuccessful. And that's many of them said, said the same thing. I didn't want, I, I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how to deal with what I was feeling anymore. And, and, you know, so it was a, they chose a permanent solution to a temporary, temporary problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that, um, uh not too long ago and even now there's people that maybe are not evil but just ignorant and they'll say things about like they used to about autism or yes. or or just or bipolar like oh it's because this child wasn't hugged as a baby or you know stuff like that but you mentioned yes it's a mental health issue yet it's very physical if you take an mri of someone's brain when they're smiling when they're sad when they're and certainly uh someone dealing with depression, someone dealing with severe, uh, you know, mental health issues, there is a physical change in the brain that, that, yeah, that does lead, unfortunately, to, to un irrational uh, uh, behavior, uh, acting out in certain ways. And um, so um, I know that you're involved, Chris, locally uh, with, is there a committee uh, for focus group of some sort? So uh, the, the, um, Oh my gosh, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, they do have support groups and they do wonderful, wonderful work in the Rio Grande Valley, um, which I would invite anyone to comment under your, um, under this uh, video afterwards, if they want any information on resources. Um, I'm also, I've walked every year in the um, AFSP out of the darkness walk, which is uh, in the fall. And um, I am part of the Dago County Mental Health Coalition. Uh, but um, we, I mean, the more the merrier of getting people involved and, and we really need to do more in our schools. You know, when, when McAllen ISD used to have MAST program, and we had mental health counselor at all of our uh, secondary campuses. Wow, that was just, I, I, of all of the cuts I have seen over the years, to me, that was the most painful to see because our kids today need mental health help more than ever. And um, I through this COVID that uh, we're gonna need it uh, I mean, so much because of anxiety over masks, the fear of, am I going to get it? Or the frustration for some people thinking we're going to get something. So, and, and just the whole education thing, you know, as schools try to um, or, um, decide whether it's hybrid or, or all online or all in school. And all of this is very stressful for us, let alone our kids. Yeah, um, we, I know that, uh, I mean, studies have been done over, over the years about, about online, uh, online education, and uh, especially for young kids, let's say in, in elementary, kindergarten, first grades, younger, younger kids especially need that interaction with other students, with their teacher. They need at least a face-to-face -face like this, uh, quote unquote, you know, at least a video chat mm -hmm. at minimum. Uh, you know, in lieu of, of course, you know, in, in person, but when it's just audio or when it's nothing, I mean, the, there we're not just educationally, though that's part of it, but just uh, socially, though, 
what is the connection between social well-being and education? I think there's a huge, um, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, with the personality I have, I could not, not have, been, I don't think I could have been happy mentally. And I'm not sure I would have continued my education had it been um, solely online because I love the action within a classroom and I loved it as a student and I love it, loved it as a teacher. And so, but I, I think there are some kids that it's, that that really works for them. But I would say there are many, many other kids who it just doesn't work for. Um, but you'll, you, you see those, uh, you all know, you see those, uh, uh, um, the roller coaster of education as I call it. But um, right now we see the whole, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, social, you know what I'm talking about, Daniel. Distancing. No, uh, we're, right. the whole idea of bringing in the um, emotional aspect in education mm. and McCallum actually has a big push toward it, actually. Um, but it's, you know, because they everybody has understood that, you know, where you are socially and emotionally plays a huge role in your success in a classroom. Yeah. Right. Well, and. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to be crass and forgive me my question, uh, forgive my ignorance. Um, I just know that ki kids who, who die from bulimia, uh, that doesn't show up in a death certificate as if it doesn't exist. Um, you know, do, do states allow for suicide to go on a death certificate? I don't know if different states differ or what. Do you know the answer to that, Ken? I, I, I'm not sure on the death certificate. Oh, this, I'm sorry. Um, I think you might be able to answer that, but one of the things I do want to say is uh, when Tim passed away um, in his obituary, um, my parents um, put, um, I don't know, remember if they said suicide. I think they did say suicide obituary, and there were people who contacted me over that. Like, oh my gosh, my family ever talked about that and I was like oh well, I, I don't I think in my family it was just like a matter of fact that is what happened and it wasn't meant to be bold and it wasn't it was just this is how it's away you know and but Adam do you know about the death certificates in I do not I do not um, and uh, just because of uh, not only statistics but uh, which is, you know, very cold, but I'm, I'm just, you know, how are we going to talk about it if we can't talk about it? You know? Well, and I know that, I know that now there are actually, cause one of the, um, Dr. Um, I think, um, she's in the mental health coalition and, um, she, they do collect statistics, um, on the side. So it is reported, of course, to the police departments and, and to the county and so forth. But we don't discuss that very much. Um, I, I have to add something there. You know, we've had a number of students in the real Valley uh, as a result of suicide over the last like eight years or so. And at one point I reached out to some local media and said, you guys, like, this is, a, this is a crisis right now. Like it's happening too much. And, and, um, everyone I contacted said we made a decision as a, that if we discuss it and um, result in more, you know, and, and so forth. And I, I think I cried because I was so frustrated. And while I understood that position, because you, you know, you do see that. And, and I, I mean, I've seen it in my own family that Tim's death has caused some real depression and uh, in my own family, oh, you know, again, in those waves. Um, but, but there does need to be a conversation because it's there, it's real. And um, this is where you go to get help and, you know, so forth. So I think it, it's, it has to be a full conversation, not just, oh, this many, you know, students have died as a result of suicide. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think um, 
I think, yeah, we all learned a lot after after we lost him. But I think one of the biggest things we learned was that we have a pretty significant family history, um, you know, of, of mental health um, illnesses. And our grandmother's uh, was it her brother, Chris, her her dad, her dad committed suicide, and that was something that we didn't know. And you know, it wasn't you know we didn't talk about it. And so I mean, I think it's real important for people to know what their family history is, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. And it's just like you would want to know if your family had heart disease. Again, it's back to that thing where you need to know your family history, and you know, just so you know, something like that. And I think that I mean, I think we all could have benefited from knowing that kind of stuff when Tim was still here, because we might have all known, oh. You know, like this is th what that is, and it might have made him even feel better, and you know, yeah. not right. so you know confused and hopeless, and you know all those Compared. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, or or you know, who knows? I mean, genetically speaking, he he may have gotten that that sort of gene slash yeah. the the blonde hair gene too from the same grandpa yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about the eye color and hair color. Yeah. It's goes a lot deeper. And I, yes. I know what you mean about the media, uh, you know, response and, and school administrators seem to have the same response where they just shut it down. This, this, this one kid commits suicide at some school. It never even makes it to the media, to the news at all. It's, mm -hmm. it's shut down right away by the family and, and, and administrators or whatever, because they don't want the copycat, you know, situation, but right. it's, we have this uh, wrong idea in society that, that teenagers are not living real life. Oh, like, oh, wait till you get out of high school. Then you're, it's going to be real life. Well, this is real life. They're going through separation. They're going through uh, breakups that are heart, I mean, literally, you know, heartbreaking breakups. They're going through parents in prison. They're going through economic situations. They're, um, if, if the parents are broke, the kids broke too. They're going through real life right now. It's that not on real top life. of hormones, and I'm Say not again? joking. I said that on top of hormones, and I'm not joking. Like that, that just escalates everything. Yeah, no, it's valid. That's very true, and and because of that, we need to empower folks. If it's just like, oh, so so and so did this, and this happened, then it's just gossip. And I understand we don't want to go and be the media and just have gossip. We want to empower folks with how to fix this, how to prevent this, what to do about it, who to reach out to. So definitely media, we need y'all to really get this out, get out there because kids are, all of us are going through problems, but, you know, especially our youth. I mean, they're going through so much, not just with COVID, but even before that, so much, so much, so many life pressures and kids that, uh, that hide. I, we got parents uh, who will, the kids have all the right shoes, all the right jeans. Uh, uh, blue jeans and clothing, but they uh, maybe even a phone, but they 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 can't pay the light bill, and and the parents decided, you know what, I don't want my kid picked on. They're gonna go to school with all the right looks, uh, and even though we cannot afford the light bill right now, because the parents are aware of the pressures that that they're, they're these kids are facing. So we need to step it up definitely, uh, if, if not for ourselves, for our youth. Um, as we start to I, close, Chris, go I ahead. Wanna, I, I, sorry, I, I want to add something there because um, the point you were making is really important too in the sense that um, I can't stress enough to parents out there um, after teaching for 29 years, the importance of going well beyond surface talk from the time your kids are little. Because I think, you know, there's that saying about the best gift that you can give your kids is T-I-M-E. And I think that's true. Like, it's way better than the newest phone and everything is to actually spend time with your kids and, and um, really talk to them. Because in most cases, if you wait until they get to middle school or high school, when they start having those hormones and things become so big, um, a lot of times it's too late in the kid's mind, you know, to really talk um, then. And, you know, also for parents and all educators and other community members to be aware of the resources out there so that we can come to the aid of people of all ages, not just students, our friends, our family members, ourselves, um, if we need help. 
Yeah, yeah. Our society makes it makes it so easy to hide. Some people hide by going to the gym, hide their pain, you know, by going to the gym or, and, and, and there, that's a healthy way of dealing with stuff. I, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying some people hide uh, through sex, through drugs, through bad relationships or whatever, anything to, to avoid dealing with this mental situation or, or, or what have you, or problems that they're dealing with. So, you know, one one last thing, and you touched on something that I think is important to understand is that, you know, how how depression and mental illness symptoms manifest themselves in one person, how they manifest themselves in me could be completely different than how they manifest themselves in you, Daniel, or you, Chris. Um, so it's just to keep in mind that it's whatever's out of the ordinary, you know, for you as an individual or someone, you know, that goes on for, you know, an extended period of time. But that being said, the treatments are also different. You know, I might, I might just only need to go talk to a therapist and they're going to give me the tools and things that I, you know, and just talking with them is going to be enough. And for, you know, Chris, maybe it's just exercising, you know, um, and that's enough to release that. And so it's just important to know that, that, you know, what works for one person could be different from another person. That doesn't mean it's, you know, bad or any worse than anybody else's. It's just that difference um, in, in the individual. Yeah. So um, thank you all so much. Chris, Cindy, for Thank opening you. up. I know it's a difficult you know, topic to to discuss, uh, but there's there's a lot of love there and a lot of beauty there um, uh, with Tim's story as, as well as your story. Uh, and so, you know, so thank you so much for sharing. And we 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 move forward. Um, you know, in his in his memory and in the memory of, of those we've lost. Chris, I know you lost a student also, uh, an Air Force uh, uh, airman, was it? Yeah. Senior Airman Cody Hooks, who was my just amazing student at Mac High. Just again, life of the party. Like everybody at Mac High knew Cody, and I lost him to suicide as well. And I just, I don't think there is a single day that goes by that I don't think of both of them, you know, and just uh, what the world lost. So uh, again, thanks so much for opening up, for sharing, and uh, for for spending a little time with us. And uh, hang in there with this whole COVID thing. I hope it goes away pretty soon. Me uh, too. But, yeah, uh, but also, we work we work to deal with it. If it doesn't go away, we have to be proactive and and uh, can't just wish things away. We have to work proactively to to deal with them in a healthy manner. So, thanks for sharing, and and uh, we'll we'll talk so much, again soon. Daniel. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.